Me again. He's fed up with my mush by, <laughs> by the end of the service. Well, good morning once again, and good morning to those who are joining us via live stream. We're glad that you're here, and we hope you're encouraged this morning. It's been the first week of a new year. Amen. This time of year always brims with new possibilities, new opportunities, new beginnings. Out with the old and in with the... Hey, you're with me. I love it. Perhaps some of us began new regimes or resolutions, new fitness regimes. Tim's back at the gym again this week. <laughs> new diets. <laughs> new goals. New haircut goals. I said I'd get a haircut last year. Never got around to it. Right? But new beginnings. Happy New Year, everybody. In right. keeping with this theme of new beginnings, I'd like to go to Mark's Gospel this morning. And where do you think we're going to start reading in Mark's Gospel, given our theme? At the beginning. There we go. Where all good stories start. At the beginning. Mark introduces us to a new beginning. A new beginning for God's people Israel. And dare we say it, a new beginning for the whole cosmos. Are you ready? Mark, chapter 1, beginning at verse... Well, all right, you're with me, really. All right. The beginning, told you. <laughs> the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. And the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Now John, he wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. And he ate locusts and wild honey. And he had hair like me, I think. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And at that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee. And he was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descended on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven saying, You are my Son whom I love. <clears throat> With you I am well pleased. And at once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and the angels attended him. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have you ever listened to a song and it reminds you of another song? Ever listened to a song and said, this reminds me of something else, right? There's something in the lyrics, something in the melody, something in the movement of the tune that says, oh, this reminds me of another tune. Uh, recently, we stuck on, it was on the telly, uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber's uh, Joseph and his Technicolor Raincoat, Dreamcoat, Raincoat, Dreamcoat, right? Not, not a massive fan of it myself, won't tell you in our house who likes it. Uh, but, and in fact, the Donny Osmond one has not aged well. If you've stuck that on recently, it has not aged well anyway. So it's got two strikes. But anyway, there's a song in there called Any Dream Will Do, you know that song? Well, every time I hear that song, it reminds me of a hymn we sing in church. And then one day we'll cross that river and face life. Right? It sounds like another song. Anyway, we could do this all day. You could tell me about songs that sound like other songs, right? You get the point. Sometimes you hear a song that reminds you of another song. Are you with me? Well, the attentive listener to Mark's story this morning, to the beginning of Mark's story, may have been reminded of another story 
another beginning. You know, songwriters, they don't intentionally want to sound like other songs. That happens by mistake and they get sued. <laughs> but Mark, I think he is intentionally wants to bring to our mind another story, another beginning that helps us to understand the one that he's telling us today. Mark starts his gospel with the beginning. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. In the beginning. Here's the beginning. Where else in scripture do we hear the words in the beginning? Genesis. All right. In the beginning. God made the heavens and the earth. Mark starts his story in a similar way to the whole Bible begins. The whole of creation begins. Is this a little subtle reference from Mark all the way back to that first beginning? Or maybe you might say, no, you're clutching at straws there. Just use the word beginning, right? It just sounds the same. Keep listening. Keep listening to the story that Mark is telling because I believe it is woven with these images and references to creation. Mark, at Jesus' baptism, talks about how, this, how the Holy Spirit when he came up out of the water, descended like a dove and hovered over the place where Jesus was and over the waters. Tell me, where have we heard the kind of language of the Spirit descending and hovering over the waters? Where have we heard that before? Genesis. At the creation story. Subtle little echoes. At Jesus' baptism, it is one of the few places in the whole New Testament in fact, one of the few places in the whole of Scripture where God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit share the same theme. One of the few places in the whole of Scripture when Jesus comes up out of the water, the heavens are open, the Spirit descends, and the voice of the Father says, This is my Son, whom I love, and with whom I am well pleased. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit all in the same scene. There it is. You need a proof for the Trinity. There it is. The Trinity at work together. Tell me, where else in Scripture do we see the Trinity sharing the same scene other than at Jesus' baptism? Genesis. Creation. Or maybe you're saying, I don't remember Jesus being back there in creation, right? Well, God, through His Word and the life-giving Spirit, brought creation into existence. God, through the power of His Word, He spoke creation into being. God, through the power of His Word and the life-giving Spirit, brought all creation into existence. And John will flesh this out a little bit more for us. And he'll say that Jesus is the living Word, who was with God when? In the beginning. God the Father, God the Word, and the Spirit with God in the beginning. I find it curious that this of Genesis when uh, God says, let us make man in our end. Us, plural. Let us, because the Trinity, Father, Son, Spirit, are there at the beginning. God the Father, God the Word, and God the Spirit share the same scene at creation. The beginning of Mark's Gospel alludes to that first creation. Tell me, when God created everything, what did He call it? Good. He made it and he called it good. The Hebrew word tov, which means good, pleasing, delightful. And here, as Jesus comes up out of the water, he says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased, and whom I delight, and who I think is perfect. Echoes of creation in Mark's opening story. Tell me, was Satan not the first creation? Right? Makes an appearance. Oh, no, he didn't. I really wanted to see if that would work. <laughs> Feels a bit pantomime today. Ah, no, I'm kidding. But yes, Satan makes an appearance that first creation tempts Adam and Eve away from the life that God has made for them. And here in Mark's Gospel, that same tempter makes an appearance and seeks to lure Jesus away from God's plan for him. Creation echoed again in Mark's stories. You didn't believe me when I started telling you this, and now maybe you're seeing it, right? Tell me, were there wild animals at that first creation? Yeah. 
Adam and Eve sauntering around uh, the animals, right? They seem to have a pretty good relationship, right? Jesus, Mark, that's that little quirky phrase. Jesus was in the wilderness with who? The wild animals. <laughs> this little picture of Eden, almost there. What is Mark up to? John, of course, will flesh this creational language much farther. But why is John alluding with all this creation imagery? Why is Mark, sorry, why is Mark's opening account so vividly full of creation? Well, I think Mark is showing us that this new work that is beginning through Jesus is as significant, as important, as creation itself. Mark is showing us that this new beginning in the arrival of Jesus is as earth-shattering, as mind-blowing, as when the stars first catapulted into the sky and the rosebuds bloom. When Jesus comes, it changes everything for you, for me, for the ancient people of Israel, and for the whole cosmos. Mark is showing us that in Jesus is a new creation, a new beginning for this whole world that will deal with the mess, that will deal with the failures, that will deal with the brokenness of that first creation. Is it making sense? And we remember that old creation. We remember that old story. God made a perfect world and he called it Good, totally perfect. And Adam and Eve, they dwelled in that perfection until they didn't. Tell me, did Adam and Eve give in to Satan's temptation? Yes. And so began for humanity a spiraling legacy of distance from the God who made us and the life he desires for us. So began from that first creation, a snowballing mess of sin and destruction and death and ruin and all the ugly things that plague our world. A humanity detached from the Heavenly Father who longs to fill us with His goodness and with His love. In fact, the, the prophet Isaiah describes the fall of humanity, that the people are living in darkness, deep darkness. As if creation itself has come undone. The people are lost, aimless, fragments in the vast universe without our God. Life is meaningless, purposeless without our God. When my father comes home. And Mark, he paints a picture for us. He paints a picture of all these people coming out to the Jordan River. And they're lining the banks of the river. And I love how Mark says, all the people of Judea, <laughs> all the people of Jerusalem. This isn't a few. According to Mark, it's all the people. I'm not sure how many people lived in Jerusalem in the first century, but I'm going to guess it was a pretty large group. But vast amounts of people, enough to get the attention of the Pharisees, are going out to the Jordan River to get right with God. Vast amounts of people are going out to the Jordan River to be where God is. Tell me what I got to do to get back to God, John. I got to wash in the waters, let it be so. People are repenting and turning back to God because I've got a hole in my heart that only God can fill. Mark paints this picture of this mass crowd gathered at the Jordan, desperate to get back to God. And they must be pretty desperate because they're taking spiritual advice from a man dressed with the clean camel clothes, all right? <laughs> desperate. I want to get back to God. And Mark, the herald angel said, I've got good news. I've got good news for you about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come to us. Our despair is turned to rejoicing because Jesus is here. And Mark paints this vivid picture in Christ's baptism. Boom. An act of creation. Heaven opens. The Spirit descends. And Jesus becomes the source of new creation on earth.
Jesus becomes the place where heaven and earth meet and where life bursts forth from. John says, I'm pretty good, but someone's coming after me who's far more powerful than I am. In fact, I'm not even worthy to stoop down and open a shield. Because I'll baptize you with water, but he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He's going to baptize you with that same spirit that brought creation into existence. He's going to baptize you with that same life-giving spirit that dwells in Jesus at his baptism. He's going to baptize us with that same life-giving spirit. Jesus becomes the source of new creation on earth. And every sickness that Jesus encounters is reversed to life. Every word that Jesus speaks builds in people new life, new creation, budding with life inside. It burns within their hearts the words that Jesus hears. It's like an old movie that was uh, black and white. I don't know, some of us may remember black and white televisions, right? But everything Jesus touches comes to life in, in the technical like an old movie, a black and white movie, that suddenly, when Jesus starts to touch things, it bursts into technical. Jesus becomes the source of new creation on earth, and everything and everyone Christ touches jolts to life. In fact, Christ will enter into death itself, and he will burst through from its clutches, raising victoriously to new life. Christ is the source of new creation, the giver of new life to all. At Christ's coming, it is an act of new creation. Are you getting this? In him was life. And that life was the life of all humankind, says John. Paul, we've read it already. For in him, all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Jesus said of himself, I have come to give life and life a little bit. Life for all. And behold, saith the Lord, in James Version, I am making all things Anyone who is in Christ Jesus is an old creation, right? Ah, anyone who is in Christ Jesus is a new creation. Christ makes things new. New beginning is a theme around this time of year. But maybe for some of us, new beginning sounds like a pipe dream. Because we're too stuck in the past. Maybe new beginning sounds good for other people, but not so much for me because I'm stuck. Maybe for some of us, those same faces, those same words, that film reel that plays in the back of our minds, continually on repeat, and we can't switch it off, we can't get away from it, and we can't move on. Those old memories that we cling to, a past that takes hold of our present. Maybe there are some of us who think that we fail too big to deserve a new beginning. Maybe there are some of us who think that we fail too big to deserve a new beginning. We let our loved ones down, our families, our marriage, our friendships. We think we fail too big to deserve a new beginning. It's not possible for me. Maybe there's some of us who are just stuck in the same old patterns of behavior that rob us of reliving. Well, this is just the way I am. This is the way I've always been. It's the way I'll always be. Maybe there's some of us who are just stuck in that mode of operating. New beginning sounds like a pipe dream. But I want to declare to you this morning, and not my name, not in your name, but in the name of Jesus Christ, that Jesus can and will make us new. Christ can do a work of new creation in your life and in my life. Because here's the thing. If lives cannot be made new, then there's no point in us even being here this morning. If lives cannot be delivered from darkness and sin, then we're just telling my stories and singing my songs up here. 
If lives cannot be made new out of the old mess, then we're just the social club and our gospel is powerless. But I want to declare to you this morning, in the name of Jesus Christ, that new life is possible because of Jesus. New life is possible because Jesus has come. The good news of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, is that new life, new possibilities, new creation is ours to the glory of God the Father. May we have the faith to believe it. That's the miracle. Often we pray for the big miracles, the healings, and absolutely we should want them. But the miracle of the church is that ordinary people in ordinary places are made new every day because of Jesus. That's the miracle. That's what keeps us gathering here every Sunday morning, amen? When I came back to Greystone, three years ago now, I didn't, no, I, I always knew people could be made new, but I was like, I hope it happened for us. <laughs> hope we see some people with some transformed lives. And just before uh, we took the, the Christmas break there, I was uh, at the school picking up my kids. And I saw an old friend who I hadn't seen since we were probably drinking vodka down the south beach around the fire, right? When we were about 15 years old, right? That was the last time I, I saw her, or was in her company. And she came running up to me, and she said, Luke, you're a pastor. <laughs> and I said, yes. She said, Jesus has completely changed my life. She said, I've done a complete 180. I'm a I'm on fire for Jesus. And I got back to my car holding back tears. Because what a miracle it is that in same old Greystones, same old Church of the Nazarene, God can produce new creation, new life. Let it be so. In John 17, verse 3, Jesus tells us what real, full, lasting life is. It's not a big secret. It's not something hidden in some you know, thing we can subscribe to on YouTube and get the wisdom and the answers. It's not a big secret. Jesus tells us in John, 15, verse, John 17, verse 3, what eternal life is. These are not John words. These are not my words. These are Jesus. Do you want the answer? This is eternal life life that you know the only true God and, the, and Jesus Christ who we say there it is the key to eternal lasting full abundant life is knowing God the Father and the Son whom we say and that knowing is not just intellectual that's not an intellectual it is a relational knowing. Think about the person you know best. That's the kind of knowing God wants to have in our lives. Christ is the source of new creation on earth. And if we want to live, guess who we've got to be close to? Jesus. Life is defined by our proximity to the life giver. If we're far from Jesus, then we're far from living. We're far from living into the fullness of all that Christ has for us. And I dare you, Come closer. <laughs> I dare you get closer and live in the name of Jesus Christ. And if you don't believe me this morning that God can transform and change lives, then look around. We've been here about 23 years in this building. You see a couple of cobwebs up in the corner there, right? We're showing some age. But this room is full of new creation, new works of God and life in the street. And if you're not there yet, if you're not seeing yourself as a new creation, I pray this morning that you begin to become awake to the reality of all that God wants to do in your life. And I want to invite you now. If you want to step closer with Jesus into this year, I want to invite you to stand with him. If you want to begin this year, begin again, I want to invite you to stand And if standing is uncomfortable for you, raise a hand. Raise a hand. I might invite you all just to close your eyes if you would. Spirit of God, we don't want to rush away. 
Oh yeah, spirit as you hovered over the waters, over the dark waters. We welcome you to come and hover over the dark places of our lives. Hover over the shadows of our hearts, the things we hide, the things that keep us trapped in the past. And Holy Spirit, may you produce in us new creation and new life. May you put the old things to death and raise us to new life in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would help us this year, this week, this day, to enter more fully, more richly, more faithfully into knowing the one true God and the Son whom he sent. Lord, would you help each one of us to live into the fullness of eternal, abundant life that you have for us. Lord God, we acknowledge this morning that it's not on our own. We don't have the, the smarts enough. We don't have the strength enough to walk this journey of faith alone. And so we acknowledge and we recognize that same spirit that descended upon our Lord. That same spirit that descended upon creation and brought it into being is the same spirit that indwells the church in our hearts this very morning. And so do a work afresh in our life, we pray. Do a healing anew in each one of us, we pray. Fill us up with wells of living water that we might overflow with the abundance of God. All who are thirsty, all who are weak, come to the fountain. Dip your heart in the stream of life. Let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of His mercy. As deep cries out to be, we sing calm, Lord Jesus, come, come, Lord Jesus.